I'm Allie Irvin. I lead the customer success team at Extreme Networks as of a few weeks ago. Uh, previously, I led the global digital scale team. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is why digital touch leads to extremely sticky customer journeys. And I'm honored to be here with my colleague, Lindsay Davidson. Hi, guys. I'm Lindsay Davidson. I'm director of customer success at Extreme. And I specifically focus on our high touch team. Um, so what is Extreme? Um, we are an, a, a network infrastructure company with a cloud solution. So we're traditionally a hardware company, but we're looking to expand our SaaS portfolio. So you can think about not that long ago, um, sitting at a football game and you're trying to text someone, you're trying to like post something on Facebook, whatever you want to do, and you can't get your phone to work. Um, well, some of our biggest partnerships are with groups like the MLB, the NFL, and now your phone works at those. So that's our fun example of what we do. Um, so today we're excited to talk about how we've implemented customer success for the first time and specifically our digital touch approach. I'll turn it back over to Lindsay. I mean, Allie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and Lindsay and I have worked together for years before we came to Extreme Networks. We have fun together. Um, and we're really sad that our CSN, Liz, is not here but for good reason, she's about to have a baby. So um, we love working with Liz and, and the folks at Tango. So here's what we're gonna cover today. We'll talk first about why you should think about digital touch when you think about customer success. Um, we're gonna uh, try to make the case that you should be thinking about digital touch, um, regardless of where you are in your customer success journey, what your product looks like. Um, it's a good fit for everybody. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, so we have a, our, an entire engagement model that is digitally led. Um, you don't have to go that way. You can incorporate it into different journeys, different engagement models. It complements that, those other engagement models really well um, and just contributes to scale and stickiness. Um, so we'll talk about that. Then we'll get into when and where we think you should think about digital touch for customer success. So the way we thought about this was you know, defining our journey first starting small, so not trying to do everything at once. Starting small, we'll talk about how we made those choices and how you might be able to make those choices. I'm using a data-driven approach, thinking about the phases, the products, or the customer segments where it makes sense to start a digital customer success engagement model. And then I'll hand it over to Lindsay. We'll stop for a quick poll in the middle, so get ready, get your phones out. Um, I'll hand it over to Lindsay, who will talk through the details of exactly how we did this at Extreme and how we are still doing this. We'll be the first to say, we're still doing this. We haven't figured everything out. We're still building. We have a lot of work to do. Um, but we'll talk about the process that we've gone through for the past year or so and how we got to where we are. So how we built our team and how we established our plan for success. We know where we want to go. Um, and now we have a good plan to get us there. And we'll talk about the progress that we've made. So first, we'll talk about why does digital engagement matter? Why should we care about this? Why is this important? Want to make sure we have everybody's attention and, and you know, we're all um, thinking about why this is worthwhile, why, why we're going to listen to us talk about digital engagement for the next 30 minutes. Why is it important? Um, before we do that, will define what we're talking about when we are talking about digital touch customer success because it is a pretty new discipline. It's growing very fast. I'm really rapidly growing segment of customer success, but it's pretty new. So what is this? And we might all have different definitions of it. The way I think about it might not be the way that you think about it, but here's what we mean when we're talking about digital touch for customer success. First, it's delivered through different modes of technology. So that's probably the most obvious. But when we're talking about this engagement model, it's different from our kind of person-led customer success model where we've got meetings and calls, and personal emails. Our digital touch is delivered through technology. So maybe that's through our website, through a customer portal, in the application, through campaigns. That's kind of the first characteristic. Secondly, it's delivered or it can be delivered at scale. So when I think about a digital touch engagement, I kind of think about that hand in hand with something that can be automated, um, which scales, of course, really well. So it's automated or can be automated. It scales or it can scale really well. It's based on triggers. So this happens, then let's do this. And obviously, we use the Tango to enable that for us. Thirdly, it's executed or can be executed with a high customer to customer success professional ratio. 
you, um, each of your customer success rep representatives is gonna work or can work with or support many customers in a digital touch engagement model. Um, and then lastly, and I think most importantly, is it incorporates self-service resources and tools. So it gives customers the resources they need when and where they need them. We're following our customers along the journey. We're looking at what resources they need to move them to the next step, to move them along and to create stickiness. And we're delivering those resources exactly what they need at the right time in the right place um, so they can invest in their journey and move forward. And that's the point I want to spend a little bit of time on. I think this is the most important piece of what a digital touch customer success engagement model is and why it matters. Has anybody seen this statistic before? This has been floating around there for a while. This is like one of my favorites. I always go back to this one. So four-fifths of customers will attempt to take care of an issue themselves before they reach out for support, before they reach out for help. I am totally this way. So I will, has anybody done this? Be at Starbucks and open up my Starbucks app and like order a drink when I could just walk up to the counter and order it. Who has done this? I know I'm not the only one. Thank you, Jamie. Um, or, I mean, my favorite is the Domino's app. I know it's faster if I just pick up the phone and call Domino's to order a pizza, but I always do it in the app. I open the app, I always forget my passwords, so then it takes me a minute to get my password reset, and I order my pizza. And I mean, I think it's because these, um, you know, when you're engaging with the technology yourself, it gives you a sense of agency. You have control, you have visibility that you don't have when you're working directly with somebody. Um, you're really investing in your journey, in your experience with that product in a way that you're not when you're, um, when you're listening. You're really actively taking a part in your journey. So there's really some psychology here. Um, you know, having control, that sense of control is a good feeling. I have a three-year-old son and he's in this stage right now where it's like, I can do everything by myself. He wants to do everything by himself. And I try to let him. Um, <laughs> but he, because we know this, we all, it feels good to do things ourselves, to accomplish things ourselves. So that's why I think that a digital touch customer success engagement model does create a sticky journey. It's because it's relying on self-serve resources. It's letting the, giving the customers a way to invest in their own journey and, and move themselves forward in a way that, you know, um, a strictly, you know, a, a journey that doesn't include self-service resources might engage your customers, but in a different way where they're not quite as invested, they're not, as, they're not able to move themselves along in this way. So that's why Digital Touch contributes to that exceptional customer journey and, and leads to stickiness. So that's why Digital Touch. Um, that's why we thought about Digital Touch first at Extreme Networks. Now we're gonna talk about when to consider and where to consider implementing Digital Touch. And we'll talk more specifically about the questions that we asked at Extreme when we opted to build a digital first customer success engagement model. We launched our customer success team um, a, a year and a half ago, we started to build, um, and our first real customer success engagement launched earlier this year. So we're still quite new. Um, and our first engagement is digital first. And we'll talk about the questions that we asked and why we considered that. Um, so four questions here. I wanna emphasize, not a checklist. You don't have to meet all of these criteria to be, you know, have um, a customer success engagement that, that makes sense um, for, uh, to, to be digital first. But these are questions to ask. Um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but you can also pair this with another engagement model. Just things to think about. Um, and maybe think about also, you know, if you are thinking about digital touch and you don't have one yet, maybe think about are there products that make sense for you to implement a digital first engagement model or customer segments um, or phases of the journey. So first, the first question we asked ourselves was, how many customers do we have? So if you are a brand new company, or maybe you have a brand new product, you have very few customers, you might not go first to digital because you might really want that very personal, very intimate connection with your customers as you're you know, in those very early stages. At Extreme, our customer success team launched um, you know, at year 26 of our company being around. We've got tens of thousands of customers, so we knew right from the beginning, whatever we were gonna do, we needed to have reach, significant reach. 
So that checked one box for us to go digital first. Second question we asked ourselves was related to product cost. So how much does our product cost? Related, what is our labor cost model for customer success? So how much revenue for every product sale do we have to fund our customer success team? And if that number is low, you're gonna need a lot of customers um, to fund your, for every one of your customer success team members. And then the incremental cost of a new customer um, is pretty low. Your, your customer success team, um, you, know, you don't need to hire many more customer success managers to, to um, support more customers. So our labor model at Extreme, we knew we needed scale for the customer success team. Um, the, way, the way we are, um, our, you know, our, our labor cost model for customer success, we needed, um, we needed many, many customers uh, for each customer success rep to support. Um, third question that we asked ourselves was, um, how many user types do we have or how many use cases do we have for our products? And this is a case where, um, you know, in, for Extreme, we had many user types and many different use cases. We know that for every one of those use cases and user types, we have to create content to move those customers through that journey, move those users through that journey. So here we said, okay, we have a lot of different use cases. There's a lot of different journeys. We're just gonna start small. So we decided to start with onboarding, with one product and really one use case, and we'll grow from there. Finally, what is the buying process for your product? So at Extreme, uh, we have more traditional buying process. If you're you know, SaaS, e-commerce, this is an obvious great fit for a digital engagement model to be really seamless. Um, we don't have that, but that was okay. Um, we said this is, this is gonna work for us, it just means we have more handoffs that we need to build in. So you know, we have different points along the line where different reps at Extreme are talking to our customers. We have a renewal specialist, we have a field sales team, we have partners. Um, so we just have more handoff points in our journey. And then that means there's also points of our journey where our data, we know our data might be imperfect because of a lag of getting data into the system, and that's okay too. We've just kind of built those time buffers into our journey to account for that. So that's the why digital and the how and when to think about digital. Um, now I'm gonna hand it over to Lindsay to talk about how we implemented our digital first customer success team. Before Lindsay goes through that, we're gonna do a quick poll. So um, if you open up the Bizbo app and you find this session, you scroll down to the bottom of the session and there's a button that says take poll. So we'll pause here for everybody to take the poll. We just wanna take a quick check in and see how would you best describe the state of your customer success team? So are you in building stage? Did you just launch? Have you been around for a while but you're undergoing a big overhaul? Um, are you mature, maintaining steady state? Or are you adding capabilities and in a real growth phase but not brand new? So let everybody answer the poll and then we'll check out the results. Right. It looks like a lot of people have figured out the app. Great. Um, so it looks like we've got a pretty good spread, mostly in the first two groups, but we've got some representation everywhere. Um, so like Ali mentioned, Extreme launched customer success about a year and a half ago with capabilities launching earlier this year. So we're definitely in that first bucket in the building stage. Um, but we have learned a lot along the way that can be applied at any point. Um, that you're at with introducing customer success. So like Ali mentioned, um, we, go. Um, we started from scratch to launch customer success. Um, and we really bucketed our efforts into three groups. Taking a data-driven approach, mapping the customer journey, and building the team. So we'll talk about each one of those a bit more. So first we wanted to make sure we were using data in our decision making. First we needed to get a grasp on what data we had today and how we could best utilize that data. We also wanted to use data to inform our decision making on where we should focus and make the biggest impact. So some things we learned in evaluating our data, um, which was a bit of a mess, but uh, we looked to strive for progress, not perfection. An example of this is when we launched our health scorecard. 
We knew what our ideal state looked like, but we launched with what we had today. Um, and it continues to be an evolving health scorecard where we keep adding in data that we get. We also learned that it's great to bring in IT early. Um, let them be your data experts, lean on them for that, and you stay the expert for the customer journey and focused on the customer journey. Um, we found it really helpful to make sure you're giving them super clear deadlines, timelines, to make sure you have the time to build that data into your success place. And last, stay focused on the customer journey. So this sounds straightforward, but can be a little bit tricky. Um, we found that it's really easy to get caught up in what data you have, what reporting you wanna have, and you can lose sight of the customer journey. Um, it's important to focus on the customer, what you wanna do with the customer and their business outcomes, and then let the data follow. So the balance of using it to help your decision making, but not let it cloud um, what you wanna do with the customer. Um, so like our, after we evaluated our data that showed we should focus on one product to have a really big impact, um, and the next step was to define those journeys. Um, so this was quite a process. Um, I'd say if you're starting from a blank sheet of paper, um, it's, it's nice to focus on the high-level journey, and then you can let the details fill in as you mature. Um, if you've already documented a journey, we feel like there's some things maybe um, you can revisit and find some learnings from what we learned. At a high level, this is what our process looked like. We establish our cross-functional stakeholders to brainstorm our journeys and personas. We prioritize the moments that matter. We establish our core capabilities within that journey. And then we operationalize our journey with tools and systems internally. If you have a project manager that can help you manage this process, it's extremely helpful. Managing all of the deadlines and stakeholders can be a big time commitment, so just make sure you have the resources you need to do this. And now we'll dig into each of these a little bit more and provide some examples of how we did it. All right, so first we establish our stakeholders. We looked across the company and established stakeholders within each team that impacts the customer. Um, if you haven't seen a RACI before, this is an example of what our RACI looked like. We took this RACI and defined it for each phase of the journey. So responsible is the person that performs the task to completion. They're the people or person that is actually getting the work done to define those activities within the journey phase. For us, these were groups like customer success, IT, sales ops, and project management. Next, accountable. Um, what's really helpful here is this is supposed to be one person. So they may delegate the task, but they are ultimately accountable for the completion of this task. And so in this case, building out that phase. These were typically the customer success leads, but sometimes were different groups of the core team. The consulted person is consulted on tasks that impact them, and they serve as advisors. These were lots of different groups, but some examples are product, customer experience, marketing, and then our exec account teams. And last is the informed group. Um, these are people that just need to be kept in the know as needed. Um, they're typically just sent email updates with the status. So these were people like our executive sponsor and then sometimes members of the broader team. So the approach we took was all of our you know, big group of stakeholders, that big group of people you get together in a conference room and kind of lock yourself in there for a little bit. Um, we established the high level journey with that group and then we used the RACI to determine how we build out those activities for each phase. This resulted in a really lengthy Excel sheet of activities, um, a bit overwhelming, so then we needed to understand what mattered the most. And that's what took us to defining the moments that matter. Um, so the way we prioritized how we go about this was doing an impact effort analysis. So we looked at the impact it would have on the business versus the effort it would take to implement that activity. So then we grouped it into quick wins, major product, projects, fill-ins, and hard slogs. So for example, you can see quick wins have a really high impact on the business and they're low effort to implement. We started bucketing our activities and really focusing on our quick wins and major projects, um, and that led us to you know, where we wanted to prioritize our work first. Um, so then, coming back to you know, our full customer journey, um, this is what our customer journey looks like. Probably looks pretty similar to a lot that you've seen. Um, but we started grouping our activities into these capabilities. Um, the green, I think it shows up as green up there too, um, are the customer success capabilities. 
the gray boxes, not sure they look very gray up there, but the other boxes are ultimately owned by other groups, but they're impacted by customer success or customer success is involved in some way. Um, and this is where we really started honing in that we wanna focus on onboarding and health as our first things. So when we implemented to Tango, those are the first groups we focused on for our capabilities. And like I said, that's where Tatango came in. We needed to operationalize these capabilities. Um, so we did that in a prioritized way using that approach we did. Um, we also used a project management tool just to keep us on track with the different deliverables we had related to those capabilities. If you don't have a project management tool, you can also um, just use an Excel sheet to, to keep track or talk to some folks here. Um, and then last, okay, so we, we understood the data, we documented the journey, we understood our capabilities that we wanted to focus on, but we needed the right team to execute this. So we found it really helpful to make some key hires. I think they're kind of unique in the industry, at least so far, um, but we hired a journey mapper who's been super helpful to get us off the ground. Um, and this person is responsible for managing, documenting, and then maturing our portfolio of partner and customer journeys, and that's still very much a work in progress. We also hired a Tatango admin who's responsible for implementing the platform across different teams. And then at Extreme, we have a portfolio team, so we work really closely with them. They own all of our services and customer success offerings across the company, so they're responsible for SKUs, pricing, and just our go-to-market strategy. Next, we wanted to look at our engagement model. So obviously we knew we wanted the digital touch so we could have that scale, but we saw that there was an appetite for a higher touch model too. Some indicators for that were that our sales teams and our support teams segment our customers, and we also have a product and customers that can be pretty complex at times. So we decided that we'd start with a digital approach and a high touch approach. That high touch approach leverages all the digital capabilities, so we're not off building our own digital capabilities. We leverage what we already have and then just layer human touch on top of that. So we decided on those two teams and we need to understand how we were gonna staff and then monetize these offerings. Um, to determine the ratio of CSMs to accounts, um, we used some industry knowledge, but then we also validated this by listing all the activities a CSM would do and the time it would take um, and how many hours they have in the day, um, hopefully not 24, um, and determined that our digital CSMs could handle about 350 accounts and our high-touch CSMs could handle five to six. This is you know, our starting assumption and we'll continue to refine that and I do imagine it'll change as we introduce new products and capabilities. And then we wanted to understand the financials. Um, so we worked with our portfolio team to embed our digital cost in our product and then our high-touch model is an additional fee. Um, and so we use those ratios um, to make sure we were covered financially. So doing all these team things to build the right team really set us up to start and I think has really set us up for growth where we can easily introduce new products, capabilities, and even other engagement models when we're ready. And last, so this was quite a process, right? <laughs> um, we wanted to make it more streamlined as we move forward. So we developed a product product launch checklist, and it's in your takeaways at the end of the aisles. Um, and so each time we introduce a new product, we go through this checklist to make sure we're accounting for everything. So we start with information gathering. This is just understanding things like, what is the product we're launching? What are the desired customer behaviors in the product? What business outcomes are they looking to achieve? And then understanding our pricing and SKUs. Then we need to define our customer journey. This includes the number of paths um, for each phase, the number of per personas, how can we leverage the journeys we already have for other products, and then understanding the key activities and interests and ex exit criteria of each phase. Then we translate that journey into playbooks for our CSM team and make sure we're enabling them, and then ultimately to Tango success plays. We also learned that we really needed to account for coordination with our teams for our data and content needs, um, and then build in time for UAT, go live, and then building out our reporting. And so, in conclusion, we've talked about 
why digital touch is important, when you might want to consider it, and how we did that at Extreme. Um, some key takeaways that we hope you take away from today um, is first, consider a digital touch engagement model if you're not already. Like Ali mentioned, this doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can layer in on the engagement models you're already doing today and provide scale and stickiness. Um, second, define your customer journey if you haven't already, but you can start small. Um, use data to help you understand where you should focus and then build a team, um, you know, have your ideal state in mind and then create a path for success with that team. And with that, thank you.